You may know that Olympus Mons is the tallest mountain in the solar system, but did you also know that it's fat? Olympus Mons is 600 kilometers wide. That means that if you were traveling at Mark 1, it'd take you about half an hour to fly across the mountain. That means if you were traveling at the speed of light, you probably be dead, but it would take you about 0.03 milliseconds to life speed make... That was a really bad... Look, the, to put things into perspective, Olympus Mons is fatter than the majority of the world's nations. It's fatter than Germany, Iceland, Cambodia. It's nearly fatter than France, if you can believe that. Whereas Mount Everest is topped with a dinky little summit. The summit of Olympus Mons is a goddamn plateau. You could build a whole city on that thing if... You know, humans could breathe pure carbon dioxide and survive at persistent sub-zero temperatures. I... But th th this is going absolutely nowhere. Good more after Eve night. Cosmonic number 12. I'm free and I hope you're all doing well. Uh, apologies for no episode last week, but this time I have a better excuse than I forgot to prep. Over the last week... No, not the last week. It's been longer than that. Over the last few weeks... I've been busy editing the Endgame video. I'm happy to report that it's finally complete and, barring any unforeseen issues, is scheduled to release this week. How exciting. But now that it's done, this might be a little too early for reflection on a project that isn't out yet. Though, by the time this episode is uh, out, it should be available for people to watch. But, hey, fuck it, right? I, I feel like reflecting on it. This was a Big project. Big. It was about as big as expected, but that doesn't really mean anything with regard to how long it took to make. It took, took a long time to make. Um, in between other things as well. Because I did... I, I started working on the video last year. It is now well into this year. And I did make stuff in the meantime, but I mean, that's a long time to spend on one project. Because I started writing the script. Yeah, as I, as I remember the process for it, it was, uh... I settled on the idea shortly after the crash video, which came out in March last year. And so then the process was re-watching a whole bunch of Marvel movies, which apparently means that I've watched more Marvel films than Sam Raimi did. While prepping for Doctor Strange. That's really funny, but it's concerning that that's a thing that happens with uh, with Marvel movies. That the people who are making them are not even like fully familiar with the one that came right before it. Because I, for the, for the video, I mean, in order to make a critique of Endgame, you can't just watch Endgame. You're going to be missing so much of, um, so much of the context. So yeah, it began with watching... A whole bunch of the movies. I think it was something like 15, 16 of them. All of the ones that it felt were... It felt like were super relevant. I did throw Guardians in there just because I felt like watching it though. But um... Yeah, I mean it starts with that and then writing the script. And the script took a long time to write. And then I left it for a while because I wanted to do the 12 Angry Men video. That was an idea that was more at the forefront of my mind at the time. And that was a really quick project as well. It took me less than a month. And then came back to Endgame. And then did some other stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, boy. I, I remember um, I'd finished the script. The script's been finished for a while at this point. Like, what, I mean, obviously, now the video's done, so it's obviously been finished. But the script was finished a long time ago. And then I started working on it. And I was really, really, really unhappy with the voiceover. And then I decided to restart. And when I decided to restart, I did a very smart thing, which was not reviewing the recording sessions after I did them, it was recording them, processing them, getting them, you know, MP3s, but then not thinking about, oh, hey, maybe I should listen and make sure that I'm happy with uh, the way that it sounds. I was not. And then I decided to start again. And that was such a bane. That was, that was so frustrating that I just, I decided to work on other things for a while and then came back to Endgame and then it was done. So all in all, that took a long time to finish. There are a lot of challenges that come with um, trying to cut together a video that's so long. Everything 
creative in some sense is component pieces, smaller parts that come together to create a whole. But the problem is that when you're making something that ends up being two hours long, it can be really hard to see how it all slots together in its totality. And I mean, when you think about that, there are parts that you would have made months ago and making sure that it's not so disparate, that it feels like that, that it's patchwork, that you've gone back and forth and adding new sections in, making it something cohesive gets really hard when it gets bigger, because when it's bigger, it's just gonna be less cohesive overall. Well, no, so that, that's not true. I mean, you can make something that's one minute long that's not cohesive. I guess it's just that it's much more challenging to do that when it starts to balloon. And finding ways to, like, impl implementing changes and being receptive to feedback that you get from people and trying to integrate that in. One of the... So... I would, uh, I would highly encourage anybody who ever intends on making some big video project to focus early on having a really tight script because it is easier to, it is easier to rewrite than it is to re-edit. I, something that's often talked about is redrafting. Redrafting is so valuable because it's never going to be that great the first time around. Or if it is, that's tremendously lucky. There's always things that you can trim down, always things you can add, thoughts that you don't have when you're working on it then that arise later or after you have a conversation or after you rewatch the film. Something that is the case with the Endgame video, which you will see when you watch it if you choose to, that is present in the other long-form analysis uh, videos that I made in the last year or so, and, and I guess present in the like Pitiful Polemic series as well. I like to make and approach videos um, with them bound by some sort of core point. So for Crash, it was difficulty. The focus of that video was not a broad, all-encompassing... I mean, it essentially becomes an all-encompassing sort of review, but there really wasn't much of a focus on graphics or animation or the sound design or anything like that. It was much more focused on difficulty, like an exploration of the mechanics, difficulty in platformers, uh, specific platformers in this case, like, like Crash, um, ways of implementing difficulty, you know, design surrounding difficulty in this type of game. That was the point of that video. The 12 Angry Men video, the point was exploring character, but more specifically it was how much do you need to create an interesting character? How complicated do they really need to be? Can they be really simple? What do you need to establish? Um, how do you reveal it? Like, it, it, it was... You could say that character is already specific enough, but I, I feel like that's quite broad. It's trying to focus it in a little bit more. I like doing it this way because I find an analysis guided by some sort of objective to be more interesting than an analysis simply for its own sake, not to, like, downplay or sort of disparage doing, like, an all-encompassing review that is a review for the sake of a review, right? Like, the, the purpose is just to be exhaustive. That's just not the way that I like to approach it. A benefit of uh, doing it that way, I think, was that it helped keep me focused on uh, what's important. If there's a goal in mind some sort of point that you want to express. I have to imagine that just having that is helpful in keeping you... You, you, you pay attention. I mean, it's it's framing, right? The, the attitude that you have or the thought that you have while, you know, watching something or reading something will end up drawing your focus to certain aspects. Uh, I guess, potentially, to some extent... Um, to, uh, will lead you to disregard other aspects, which I guess you don't want to do. You want to you want to make sure that you're being fair. And I think it's just it's easy to become unfair when you get a bit of tunnel vision. But that focus means that you're looking for things that you may not be if you're just sort of taking a more broad approach. I could be totally wrong on that though. Who knows? The period of reflection on the project has uh, already begun. Uh, but I, su I, <laughs> I suppose I'll give myself more time to run through that on my own before I start, I guess, talking about the things that I learned 
from this project. But that is, I would imagine, an important thing to do when you finish any project or any task that was particularly challenging. Because this video was challenging. It was, it, it was, it was a hard project. Um, that was, it was difficult to make, um, to write, to edit, to just piece it all together. It, it was tough. Certainly the biggest video I've made required, um, the most amount of work in each aspect, except for viewing, I guess. Crash was, Crash was like a whole month of just playing that game, trying to complete everything, get every single gem. Man, that was, that was, that was tough from a, from a gameplay perspective, but the project moves, um, pretty smoothly. Endgame was challenging. But uh, all, all you can really do after it's done is uh, essentially just try your best to pull something from it. Like so, some aspect that you know that you're going to be able to improve upon next time around on the next thing. Uh, I probably should write it down. <laughs> but I, I, I say that and I probably won't because that would be work and I don't feel like doing that right now. Well, not right now anyway, but I, I highly doubt that I'm going to sit here with a book in front of me on my desk and start writing down, all right, what did you learn? What could you have done? Like, kind of like you're doing like a reflection, <laughs> like specifically when you're tasked with doing a reflection essay. That's probably a good idea. I don't even know why I'm laughing at it. Like as a premise, it's probably a good idea. I imagine it's, it, it's a lot easier to, I, to meaningfully reflect if you write it down. Well, hey, sometimes you learn something new from doing a, episode of a podcast as well. After much procrastination, I finally got around to watching Spirited Away last week, and I really enjoyed it. Now, I thought about making this a major topic of the episode, but um, I don't know that I can do that film justice quite yet. Uh, maybe after a rewatch? But I'll allow us to touch on it now. Um, I didn't know anything about that film other than Everybody really likes it. Uh, and that's from Studio Ghibli, the studio that seems to, at least as far as I'm aware, consistently make really good films. And so, yeah, I finally got around to watching it, and I really enjoyed it uh, the whole way through. And to summarize what I thought about it, uh, the animation was fantastic. The backgrounds were gorgeous. The world felt incredibly well realized despite being very surreal and the character work was uh, strong. I was super impressed with the world. It was the premise gets set up so quickly and you essentially have access to as much information as the main character. But similar to her, you kind of start piecing things together and understanding a method to the madness the more the film goes on. Even though it's a strange world, there's a whole bunch of people in it who are operating in a way that makes sense to them. And so, and so despite being a really bizarre premise, it's still, it's still, you know, readable. You can understand what's happening. And get a sense of the stakes as well. Look, to me, that was super impressive when I was watching that film. It was just, um, I, I, I didn't know that it was, uh, I basically had no idea what to expect from it. And it was, it was really, uh, fun to sort of watch it go along and try to piece things together as it was progressing. Speculate on the nature of the world and how everything operates. I mean, from a production standpoint, that film is, is, uh, fantastic. The anime, the backgrounds... I haven't seen a lot of uh, anime films. There was another one I saw called Your Name. I saw it a year or two ago. I remember the thing that stood out about that film was the uh, the backgrounds were incredible. And it was similar here. The backgrounds were fantastic. It's just so detailed. There's a real tangibility to these places uh, that comes through not just from uh, how well rendered they are, but also that there was there was thought put into the way that things would operate. Yeah, the problem is I don't I don't know how much I would want to say because I feel like if I uh that film warrants a more sort of thoughtful, thorough uh examination, if that was something I were to ever do. Spirited Away is a unique, charming, interesting film, and I look forward to both re-watching it and seeing the other Studio Ghibli films. I, the next one I want to watch is probably going to be Howl's Moving Castle, which I also don't know anything about. Which I think I think is the way that I want to watch those films, is to go into them basically oblivious. You know, I've heard of these films. Like, I've heard of Princess Mononoke, 
but I, I don't really know anything about it. Um, all I know about, I know that because now I'm talking about other films that weren't made by the same studio, but, um, I definitely want to see Akira and I don't know anything about that either other than a reference like the motorbike thing the the shot from the motorbike it's kind of the same with ghost in the shell as well i know what its premise is i know that's got similarities to blade runner but i'm not super familiar with that and it's is the case with the long procrastinated on which i will watch um cowboy bebop which i didn't know anything about other than space bounty hunter anime show which uh like that's a pretty good hook for a uh, for a for a TV show in my case anyway. But I will I will get around to watching those all in good time. How I finished the Endgame video, right? So now I've got more time to well, Doctor Strange is out tomorrow, or alternatively two days b before this episode goes up, or alternatively many years ago if you were watching this in 2040, uh, 2047. The next season of Halo Infinite, very aptly titled Lone Wolves. <laughs> Lone Wolves. Um, that's a funny name. <laughs> it's just a funny pairing of words. Lone Wolves. Well, that's coming out tomorrow, and I'm sure I'll have plenty to say about it next week. But in the meantime, here are some thoughts I have about the upcoming season. The sentiment surrounding this season is that it's not content rich, and I'm inclined to agree. Two maps and three modes, one of which should have been in the game at launch, Kick of the Hill, after six months of absolutely nothing, it's, it's not enough. Especially when the game didn't launch with Forge or a cooperative game mode and... Even after this season is complete, we'll still be sans game modes like Bomb Assault. Pretty sure Infection's not in Infinite either yet, right? That, how... <laughs> how nuts is that? You know, when, when you think about the amount of content. Um, because this season, it runs until November. And we know what's going to be coming out in this season. Which is, like I said, two maps... If you don't like Big Team Battle, because Big Team Battle is very different in Halo Infinite and for a long time didn't work. I'm pretty sure they fixed it now, but but I mean, if you only care about Arena, it's 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 one map and, you know, th three new modes, one of which I believe is coming later. So it's not even this. Th there's two at the start. Because there's uh, there's like Zone Control, Last Man Standing and then King of the Hill. And I think King of the Hill comes later. I, <laughs> you know, like. By this stage, didn't Halo 3 have, like... I'm, pr I'm pr Yeah, that's right. In the first... So, when this season ends, it ends in November. The game came out. I know that they say, well, the release date was December 11th, but it was, it was November 15th. That's when it came out. That's when multiplayer, and in its final form, was out. So, it will, in a year... In a year... We will have received... Two maps, and three new modes... A whole bunch of cosmetics, obviously, but, I mean, in terms of, like, playable content, Campaign Corp will finally be there by August, I believe, and Forge will have entered beta. For those of you whose memories are failing you, I'll think back on your behalf by referencing information that I looked up last night to make sure I had it right. By the end of the first year of Halo 3, there were two map packs out. There was the Heroic Map Pack and the Legendary Map Pack that included six maps for a game that launched with Campaign Co-op, launched with 11 maps, I believe, which is one more than uh, Halo Infinite has, and launched with Forge. What, what exactly is the live service of this live service game? Can someone please tell me? Hey, in exchange for all the Battle Pass money, and all the microtransaction money, you get one third, less than one third, of the content that you could have gotten back in Halo 3. Putting to one side that Halo 3 launched with way more stuff. The absence of Forge in this game is seriously hurting it. You know, community created content um, would, would, it would seriously help alleviate the content drought. Which, unfortunately, I expect to commence soon enough after the new season begins next week. If you had people creating maps and through the tools creating some interesting modes and then there was a playlist that like highlights the coolest creations of the week or the fortnight, you'd be fine. You'd be absolutely fine. Of course, people would still want those new maps coming. 
but it wouldn't be so bad. The weight wouldn't be so bad because you can play on player created maps. You could have player created maps, you know, that are doing old designs, right? Like if you had um lockout and uh if if you found a way, I don't know, if someone someone was particularly creative in Forge and if, if like high ground or something or like or, uh, Guardian. That was the name of the map in Halo 2, right? Guardian. I think, yeah. If, um, if you had players who were making the maps, that they'd be able to get them in the game, people would be able to play them, and there'd be a lot more variety. It wouldn't completely solve the problem because people would have expectations, you know, in terms of content created by the developers, but it would seriously help. Like, Forge probably should have been the priority above... Um, putting in features that, frankly, should have been there at the beginning anyway, like campaign co-op and, um, and, and this one particularly funny. The ability to replay missions in campaign. That will be added in August. I suppose the reason why I'm talking about all of this now, speculation, I suppose, more so than what will probably happen next week, which is we talk about this season... My concern is that Halo Infinite's player base will further collapse after the release of Lone Wolves, rather than grow. Because it is very far down at this stage. Launched with, what, an average of 200, 250,000, like, concurrent players. Now, at best, it's like 8,000. Sometimes gets as low as 3,000. There's no world in which 343 and Microsoft are happy with those numbers, and they shouldn't be, because this is Halo, an IP that, despite being very poorly managed for a decade, despite us receiving a a pretty awful show that um that to some extent feels like it has a level of contempt for the games, despite all of the controversies with this game, lack of content, microtransactions the Battle Pass system, even despite all of that, Halo as an IP is still big enough that there was expectations for it, a desire to play it, and when it came out, in the face of an utterly disastrous launch in the form of 2042, and from what I understand, a pretty poor launch too for Call of Duty Vanguard, in terms of its main competitors in the space that it's in, it worked, for the most part, you know, people were having fun with it, but yeah, what, you know, what happened? I mean, we know what happened, right? The, the game restarted development sometime partway through. That's absolutely what happened. I suppose we'll find out what the fate of Halo Infinite is, uh, or what it will be in the coming days. Yeah, I suppose we'll see. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is releasing this week. Forecasts project that the film will make around $200 million opening weekend and $500 million total. And this is only the US market. The Northman, which opened about two weeks ago, grossed $12 million in the US on opening weekend. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, uh, a film which I wholeheartedly recommend. I had a lot of fun watching that movie. That film grossed $7 million in the US on the same opening weekend. I hope by now that our topic has become very clear. I've noticed over the last couple of months in particular that the discourse, film, film discussion on Twitter has in, in somewhat large part been dominated by people shitting on Marvel, which... I'm not gonna scoff at, right? Like, I think that Marvel is is not not making a lot of good stuff right now. Um, we we are we are definitely in the era of like hyper Marvel sludge. Uh, however, I found that this discussion there's been things about it that have been interesting to ponder. There's obviously been the discussion about CGI cinematography, especially in the wake of the Batman. We talked about that on an episode of Cosmorotic, the episode number of which I forget. But the discussions I've seen recently have been, I've seen a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of positive buzz surrounding the film Everything Everywhere All at Once. I've seen a lot of tweets with a decent amount of likes talking about how great it is and how everybody needs to go see it. And uh, I, I would like to see it. It hasn't made a lot of money, though. It's it's not made a lot of money at all. 
Uh, I think it's made more than it cost, narrowly, but it didn't cost a whole lot. I think, I think in total it's made like $40 million on a budget of $30 million, and then you got marketing and then, you know, the cut, right? So, I've seen a lot of positive buzz, got a lot of great reviews, got a lot of people on Twitter saying it's super unique and interesting, go watch it, that got a decent amount of likes. By decent, I mean like tens of thousands. And did that translate into people watching the film? Maybe to some extent, but, you know, maybe here's the more interesting part. I wonder how many of the people who liked those tweets about how cool that film was went to see it. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. There's never going to be an answer to that. I'm never going to get that answer unless the Twitter wizard comes to me and is like, Hello, I'm the Twitter wizard. Let me give you the analytics for your very specific questions about one movie at this point in time. But I genuinely wonder how many people went to watch it. The same goes for The Northman. The same goes for The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I mean, you just heard me, right? I watched it last week. I really enjoyed it. It was a really fun, interesting movie. Interesting by way of structure and what it was about. It had great performances. Uh, Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal had great chemistry. Th they were great in their roles. It was a really entertaining movie, and it's a movie that I imagine a lot of people who love films, especially, you know, enjoy Nicolas Cage as a personality in a lot of his films, and who are aware of his films, would really enjoy. But I'm curious how many people are going to go watch it just based on my recommendation, right? And and then I guess I'm curious to weigh up how many of those people are going to go watch Doctor Strange. Or like, how many people, even if they heard, hey, it's pretty bad, don't watch... I mean, of course, we don't know, right? It's not out yet, but uh, soon. Um, the, the, reason, the reason why I'm kind of running down this um, line of thinking is, you know, much has been said about... Marvel's box office dominance and the effect it's having on the broader industry. I've seen people... Now, that Scorsese quote was not good, alright? Uh, like, if, if the sentiment he was expressing is what I'm about to lay out that I've heard, then it is absolutely not comporting with the words that he used. But, you know, people have been pointing out... So one of the problems that stems from Marvel movies and franchise movies is there are only so many, you know, screenings per day. There's only so many screens... There's only so many times that you can have a, a show run, like a film. And when a Marvel movie comes out, you know, it, it, it just absorbs all of those screenings. I can give you an example. Like I said, I watched Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, and I wanted to watch The Northman, and I still do. And I was looking at screenings during the opening week, which was the week before, so last week. And even during opening week, it was only playing a few times a day. Meanwhile, looking forward... Doctor Strange is going to be screening over 20 times a day. And in the wake of those screenings, like the Northman is only going to be screening like once or twice a day, maybe three max at not great times. This is what happens when a Marvel movie comes out. Like nothing else is available to watch for a while. And it kind of happens with basically every big movie, right? It just dominates the... It dominates that time and especially with the culture around marvel movies as well where it's like you got to get in first you got to get in early otherwise you're going to get spoiled there's definitely like a mad rush and just like a, a bombardment of of like that content and you know the reality is is that i think that a lot of marvel content has a very short half-life in terms of its discussion i genuinely wonder if many people are going to be talking about moon knight which ends this week in two weeks. I I seriously wonder how many people are still going to be talking about it. But for the time that it's out, it's dominant. And there's always Marvel stuff out all the time. Like every two months, there's new Marvel stuff. Over the next four months, it's going to be back to back. We had Moon Knight, now we got Doctor Strange, and then there's Miss Marvel, and then that leads into Thor Love and Thunder. And then there's probably something after that too. And then there's Black Panther, and then you lead straight into the next year, you've got like Ant-Man... And you've got Captain Marvel or uh, Guardians 3. It, like, it's it's always leading into the next thing. The Marvel is just omnipresent, in a sense, in, in uh, the film. And I guess now, with the TV show's broad media landscape, it's always relevant. And every time that something comes out, it's always hogging up all of those screenings. 
Now, we we ran for a while there because I said this related to Scorsese. I saw someone say on Twitter that it's like, well, that was what he was trying to communicate is that when like Marvel, like these films, there's just these effects that it has on the industry and exposure to other films that is a little bit harder to quantify than simply looking at, you know, the box office after the fact. And that is a fair point. I would imagine that Doctor Strange is going to be among the top five highest grossing films of the year. Thor is probably going to be in there too. Black Panther will probably be in there too. And think about whatever else is coming out, right? Avatar, that's technically Disney. That may well be up there too. It's like these are, they're dominant. They're absolutely dominant. And there is a consequence for this dominance. And that consequence is that IP films are simply a safer bet than original screenplays. And I harp on this all the time, but it's because it's important. Opportunity cost matters. You go to a studio, and it's like, well, you could spend, you know, X amount of money on this new original idea that has no built-in audience because it's totally new, it's a little bit risky, or you can invest that money into a sure thing, like a Marvel movie, you know? There's not a lot of original stuff coming out of Disney anymore. You get original stuff from the animation wing, but every other department is adaptations, remakes, because it makes money. Like, it's a safer bet than doing something original. And that attitude spreads to other studios. Everybody, I've, I've said this a lot too, everybody wants what Marvel, what Disney has in Marvel. Everybody wants it. Warner Brothers certainly want it with DC. Universal wants it with Fast and Furious, and in a certain sense, they've got it. They, they are getting it. Paramount wants that with Transformers, or had it with Transformers. Now they're looking elsewhere for that same thing. Everybody wants that. They want a safe, reliable, dependable bet. I see in the wake of all of that, a lot of people shitting on Marvel, like on Marvel Studios, on Disney, for, you know, making all of these films and making these remakes. You know, we're, we're in a landscape where it is it's it is dominated by Marvel movies, Fast Furious, DC, sometimes Disney remakes. These are always topping the list of highest grossing films of the year. And you look back, you know, you go back 20 years, that just wasn't the case. You'd have like strict dramas like on that list pretty persistently. Like, in the 20th century, you know, you have, like, Superman would be high up there, and then Batman would be high up there. But, like, you had, you you just had, like, comedies and dramas, you know, non-speculative fiction, not IP films, that, that were successful, that were really successful. And now, those are kind of anomalies, right? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's unusual when, um, a non, like, PG-13 superhero or disney remake or disney animation project or uh like fucking minions or fast and furious like when any one of those films actually makes that much money it's it's rare it's just rare now and people are quick to blame marvel you know blame marvel for this trend but the sad truth is that Marvel is simply meeting the demands of the market. People are signing blame to Marvel for the dominance of superhero movies and the steady decline in the prevalence of original movies. It reminds me, do you guys remember like back when, like back in the early 2010s, like 2010, 2011, when like Medal of Honor, Battlefield, Halo, all of these shooters were starting to co-opt elements of Call of Duty, like kill streaks. They'd call them something else, like an ordnance drop or something. Perks, Halo 4 had customizable loadouts. Um, like, you know, putting in kill cams, like, all of, all of these other shooters just sort of, wow, you heard my very loud thumb click there, um, just pulling all of these attributes and putting them into their games, and people are like, fucking Call of Duty, it's like, it's not Call of Duty's fault, it's their fault, and it's, I mean, I'm about to say your fault, I mean, it would be their fault if they weren't playing those games, but I mean, you know, it's not Marvel's fault they're successful, it wasn't Call of Duty's fault that they were successful, this is a bottom-up problem. The cold truth is that Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, Thor, Love and Thunder, these are films people want to see more than The Northman, or The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, or Everything Everywhere All at Once. And the same will be true for Black Panther, it'll be true for Ant-Man, it'll be true for the Marvels, it'll be true for, like, 
and on the TV side, it will be true for all of their shows. And it's not going to change. You know, people thought there were too many superhero films in 2015. Right now, at this point, we've got what? Quadruple the amount of content every year. Like Marvel is never going to not make these films for so long as there is clearly a demand among general audiences to watch these movies. And, you know, to some extent, right, that's, that, that sucks, right? Like, it, it sucks that you can look at an array of films that are coming out that are interesting and original, and it's just, your chances are, are lower now. Chances are lower that those films are going to be successful. And that just further changes the priorities of studios. And, you know, it may well be that the priorities of the studios then feed into the priorities of the general public, right? Like, it, it may well be that it's, it's, uh, it's back and forth in terms of the feedback and what that causes. But ultimately, it stops with the audience, but it won't. Like, I, I don't see this paradigm changing. If anything, it's going to accelerate. Original films will be passed on by studios in favor of franchise sludge. And that's our fault. <laughs> Now, this shouldn't, be, this shouldn't be necessary, but to be clear, I'm speaking collectively. I'm not assigning blame to you specifically who is watching this episode, right? Like, if, you, if you're not... Like, it's our fault collectively as, I guess, the movie-going public. And, you know, why is that, right? Why is it that these films are more... I think the easy answer to that is that they are easy films. Avengers Endgame is easier than The Father. It's easier than Marriage Story. It's easier than Shawshank. It's easier than, well, I mean, a relevant topic, right? The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. It's a much easier, appro more approachable film. And they are made that way to some extent. You know, I'm, it, there's obviously creative... Uh, there's obviously creativity involved in all of these projects to some extent, right? But I mean, these are just easier projects um, for people. They're not really challenging. You know what you're getting and it's not going to be anything too confronting or too cerebral or too contemplative. It just ain't. I really got... This was so clear when... And it's so frustrating as well. Episode 5 of Moon Knight has parts in it that are just legitimately great. There are some great ideas in that film uh that that show that show like great uh material in that in that episode where we finally slow down we get more contemplative and of course that you've got all the plot problems still affecting that show but you spend all that time going a lot slower focusing on the characters but at the end we get pulled right back. We need that action scene. We're back to the plot. Let's get back to the plot. We got to come back to the plot. All right, guys. Like, yeah, Stephen, Mark, you can say, no, 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 no. We, I know you spend the time over there, but we got to get back. back we got to get back into the fight. Okay. You got to come back. We got, we got Albert. We got the hippo. You got to come back. We can't spend too long being contemplative and slow. Even when there's an idea that's there, it's like, well, no, but we still got to have the fight because this is Marvel and this is Marvel content. Marvel has a formula that is so easy and replicatable and seemingly um people don't get bored of them either i don't really see anything changing on this front and the only way that things do change is essentially that more people need to see non-ip films in theaters early early as in like in the uh, you know the first couple of weeks that it's out to demonstrate meaningfully that there is an interest in those films but the problem is it's like that's not really a solution that can be proposed, right? Like, if you're not interested in watching, if you'd rather watch Doctor Strange than The Northman, there's kind of nothing that can be done about that. That is just the nature of the uh, the demands of the market, you know? You know, those the, the numbers, the box office numbers tell us a story. Again, Doctor Strange, projection, 200 million opening weekend. The Northman, 12 million on opening weekend. For every 20 people, or for every one person who goes to see The Northman, 20 people are gonna go see Doctor Strange. I think it's safe to say that for the foreseeable future, the trend is going to continue. And whether it will reverse and what will do it remains to be seen. So this is very recent news. Uh, yesterday, Square Enix announced that they've sold Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Interactive, 
as well as their associated IPs, so Deus Ex, Tomb Raider, Thief, Legacy of Kane, to uh, embrace a group for $300 million. Now, I did not know what Embracer Group was, uh, but looking into the company, it seems to be fairly large and growing. They own Deep Silver. They own a whole bunch of, like, smaller studios that make mobile games, which I guess I'm not focused on that space. Uh, they recently acquired Gearbox. They own the studio that made Deep Rock Galactic. Like, it's a relatively big sort of group in terms of what they own. Now it's gotten a little bit bigger. The impression that you get is, like, $300 million. Really, only $300 million. Um, I think to put it into perspective, I think they bought Gearbox for $1.3 billion. I'm pretty sure PlayStation, they bought Insomniac for $200 million. And I mean, keep in mind that when, when Sony bought Insomniac, they already owned the rights to a lot of the games that Insomniac made. They own Ratchet and Clank. They own um, Resistance. They own, I mean, they own, like, the Spider-Man game that they're making. So, multiple studios, $300 million. Seems like a really good deal, especially when you're nabbing IPs that are, even despite mismanagement, they're valuable. Frankly, I think uh, Ardos Montreal and Crystal Dynamics have languished under Square Enix. I'm not sure how many of you, because at this point we're referencing gaming industry stuff that I remember from like a decade ago. I remember, God, I distinctly remember this. So from the Western studios that Square Enix owned, there was a, a string of games that had come out uh, in rapid succession, there was Tomb Raider, uh, Hitman Absolution, and Sleeping Dogs. Tomb Raider had sold 6 million copies in a few months. Uh, I believe Hitman Absolution was somewhere around 2-3 million, and it was the same for Sleeping Dogs. They were all well received. They all sold well by any metrics, especially at the time, that just seemed reasonable. And then I remember... Oh yeah, Tomb Raider under they all underperformed the Western games. Tomb Raider underperformed. Six million! Six million copies! Underperformed! And um then later on, right? Deus Ex. Deus Ex Human Revolution was successful. And that's like, we're gonna do the Deus Ex universe. And then, hey, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, augment your Do you remember that? Augment your pre-order? Where like there was the pre-order tier that depending on how many people had pre-ordered the game was going to determine the content that people would get for pre-ordering, and at the highest perk, if the game would come out early. That was awful. I wonder whose idea that was. And then, that game underperformed. If, uh, that game underperformed, and then, oh, yeah, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna put Deus Ex on hold for a little bit while we reevaluate. While we reevaluate what we're gonna be doing with that series, and we haven't had a Deus Ex game since. I, these studios have... I would say, you know, I like those uh, Crystal Dynamics Tomb Raider games. They're good. I don't think they're awesome narratively, um, but they're good. They're fun. I um, I liked Absolution. I know that Absolution's a bit controversial because it's it's pretty linear. Um, but I remember they let go of IO Interactive, and and then like Hitman was on ice, and then IO went independent, and then made the Hitman games, and they were successful by metrics that were more reasonable. And Ados Montreal. Of course, made Human Revolution Mankind Divided, both of which I really enjoy. Uh, I didn't play a lot of the, the Thief remake. I don't hear good things about that one, though. Uh, and they made Guardians, which <laughs> actually I played a little bit. I wasn't having that much fun, but a lot of people liked it. Um, but I guess I guess that's the end of that now, right? Like, that's that's the end of uh, of this era of these um, of these studios under Square Enix, and it's hard not to read, hey, you can have all of these IPs and studios for 300 million other than we're not interested in, we're not even interested anymore in having, like, these Western studios or these IPs. I don't know, it's, al it's always felt like, um, it's always felt like Square Enix's perspective on these studios and their output has been for lack of a better word, wrong. And hey, maybe things will be better under this new arrangement. Of course, that's a hard thing to say. I barely know anything about this group. I don't I don't really know what their long-term priorities are, other than I know that the, over the last few years, they've been gobbling up studios and building up a, uh, a big catalog of studios. But I suppose a real exciting thought in all of this is, will Deus Ex make a comeback? Will any of these uh, franchises make a comeback? I would say that there is absolutely still a market for... Tomb Raider, 
for Deus Ex. I think that there's a market for Thief, meaningfully. I mean, of course, I would just want Thief back because there are no stealth games. Third-person action adventure with stealth elements gobbled up stealth games as a genre uh, for reasons... And of course, I don't think that makes sense because they're different, but it definitely feels like that's what's happened. But I guess that's the concern, right, is have these IPs simply been acquired for the sake of having them? Is there really any expectation that we're going to see Legacy of Cain revival or a Deus Ex revival? I believe it, in total it was 50 IPs that they had. Will anything really come from that? It's like, well, we've got they've got the studios, but um, Crystal Dynamics is currently working with Microsoft on um that Perfect Dark reboot. So it's mainly just IDOS, and it's like, hmm, what are they going to be up to? But it's kind of hard to speak to that news because it's all looming in the future, right? What the future holds, who knows? But something I've begun to notice is that the dynamics of the gaming industry are rapidly changing. You know, in this case, we have a group that, based on what I'm seeing on the internet, a lot of people didn't even really know existed, that is huge and owns a bunch of companies and IPs. Ubisoft is apparently in the dumps and is looking to be acquired. Ubisoft, one of the major publishers in the industry. Warner Brothers is apparently shipping around at studios like Rocksteady and the licenses for these games to other publishers in the wake of the uh, Warner Brothers Discovery deal. Last year, Sony bought Bungie, but it's not a typical acquisition in that um, the, the studio's got a high level of autonomy, but it's going to help Sony collaborate on making live service games, many of them, in the next few years. Ten by 2026. Of course, Microsoft acquiring Activision Blizzard. It's still, I think there's now uh, fair trade stuff going on there, but I mean, that's something that may well be happening soon. The takeaway from all that is that the long-standing dynamics and a clear divide between platform creators and game publishers and a general idea of where the, the industry is in terms of where the studios are, where the publishers are, where the um the value is consolidated, the old landscape, the landscape that I think, in the consciousness of um certain parts of the gaming industry and and viewer uh, players, is still rooted in an outdated world, or an it's just not up to date. The long-standing dynamics of the industry are steadily being eroded in favor of a new, more complicated industry. It's just not the same as it was 10 years ago, right? Like, 10 years ago, who are the big players? Really, who are the big players? I think people would easily say it's like EA, Activision, Ubisoft were like the big publishers. And of course, you got Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo. Now, it's like, who are the big companies? It's like, well, one of them is Tencent. Tencent owns a whole bunch of stuff. You could say that beneath that is like Epic Games, which itself is a huge part of the industry, which is in part owned by Tencent. Um, Microsoft is gigantic at this point with all of the companies that they've been acquiring. Nintendo is super dominant now, more so than they were 10 years ago. Um, Riot, which again is another one. Uh, yeah, like if you, like, you, you think about all of these, um, it's just changed a lot. And of course, you've still got people like, I was about to say Activision, but Activision's now going to be part of Microsoft. You've got like EA. It's all changing from what was a dynamic that had persisted for like a good 15 years, you could say. There's something of a divide between like the 2000s, you know, before that it was very decentralized. Now it's, and then it became super duper centralized. And I mean, in a sense, it is becoming less centralized, but also more centralized now. And I suppose what is interesting about all that is what will it mean in terms of what gaming looks like in the future? Who are the big players? What will be the big games or the big platforms? Is it reasonable anymore to expect platform exclusivity or anything to be majorly important? Or is all the money to be found in, in not you know, tying people to platforms, but tying people to a service, like a game or a, or, you know, a platform in a looser sense, like Game Pass or whatever the fuck this new PlayStation Plus arrangement is that nobody seems to be happy with. Someone's mentioned in chat, which I was thinking about as well, Valve, I mean, they're huge. And I guess they were 10 years ago, but they're even bigger now.
It's all changing. In this case, it's hard to say what will be born from the, you know, this acquisition and looking to the future with the stuff that's going on with Microsoft and Activision Blizzard, whether Ubisoft gets acquired, less independent studios and more continued amalgamation and even big players getting gobbled up by um, bigger players. It's hard to say what will be born from these acquisitions, but I'm curious and to some extent, a little bit nervous to see. That does it for me this week. Thank you very much for hanging out. This was Cosmoronic number 12. I'm Fringy, and I'll catch you all next time.